Welcome. This is going to be part one of four to an intro to VBA. We will spend the next couple minutes going through what macros are, two ways you can create them, and cell range referencing. A macro is essentially a tool you use to help automate simple and repetitive tasks. The idea is to give Excel a set of instructions or criteria to fulfill and have Excel do the work. The types of transformations you can do with macros include everything you can normally do in a spreadsheet, and having a macro gives you the power to go through much more information. Having a basic understanding of VBA also gives auditors and analysts an edge because macros are very common in most businesses and are used to drive efficiencies and creating better workflows. Being able to interpret a macro opens up the ability to find inconsistencies and create process efficiencies of your own. To start, the two, type of, the two types of macros we'll be, talk about are recording macros and the second will be to write a macro on the back end of Excel. To start recording a macro, hit the record macro icon at the top left hand corner of the developer tab. It'll ask you for a name. Use anything you want for now and hit OK. It won't look like anything happened, but if you look at the bottom left hand corner, there will be a square representing stop recording. Let's try doing something just so we can see how Excel is actually recording all our actions. We'll go to cell A1 and type hello world, then hit enter and stop recording. You have just made a macro. Let's go to sheet 2 and replay the macro we just made. You will see that it did exactly the same thing you recorded in sheet 1. It is much easier to record a macro, but the flexibility isn't there. The more complex the task, the more you would need to manually click and eventually you might run into an issue if one little thing changes. However, you could use recording macros as a means to learn how to use certain syntax or more complex tasks, like the remove duplicates function built into Excel. This brings us to our next method of creating a macro by writing one. If you press Alt F11, it will open this Microsoft Visual Basic backend. You will see a folder called modules, and then go to module 1 and open it. Note that if you did not record a macro to begin with, you can simply right click on the workbook and go to insert module and you can open the same thing. At a glance, you'll see that we are just selecting a cell and typing in hello world into it. But you'll get more familiar with the syntax as we go. You'll notice the macro has sub and end sub. This denotes where your macro is going to run or what actions it's going to do. And if you wanted to create another macro, all you have to do is go below the end sub and type in sub with the name of the macro. Let's call it macro 7. And hit enter and Excel should finish the actual bracket and end sub for you. This is where a lot of the power lies behind Excel. The learning curve goes up substantially because you would need to know how to write certain functions, but you now have the ability to completely control what Excel does by just typing. To begin writing code, we would need to understand how to reference things in Excel. We'll start with a simple cell reference. If you think of how you would normally write functions, you would refer to any given cell as A1, C2, etc. You can use these same references in VBA by typing range, and then the actual grid notation in, quote, in quotes. This stands for a string and you need this to actually use the string notation, the grid notation. And if I run this, you'll see that it'll go back to cell A1. Now, another way to write this is using the cells syntax. Instead of using the grid notation, it would be a row and a column. And this does the same thing. This will be important in the future when we get to loops because you can't really use the grid notation as you can't add 1 to A and expect to move up in columns. Now using the same logic, we can also reference ranges the same way. So using grid notation, it looks something like this. <coughs> if we wanted to select A1 to A3. If I run this, you'll see that it selects A1 to A3. But to reference it using cells, it would still be range, but you would classify the first cell 
and then the second cell in which you're going to cover the whole rectangle in between. So it would be cells, third row, first column, which stands for A3. And this would do the exact same thing. Now you can also reference whole columns and rows, and I'll give you an example of each. So columns, because you can have a letter reference, could be something like this. <coughs> but you could also reference it as a number. And both of these are okay. Rows you can only reference as a number because there's no letter reference attached. You'll see that if I run this, there will be no problems because all these work. All these are valid syntaxes. If you forget an S in columns or an S in rows, you would run into an error. When we reference a cell or range, we can make it equivalent to a number, a string, other cells, and even itself. I'll now type out a couple examples so we all recognize what they do. So for instance, we can make cell A1 equivalent to cool, and cool is a string, so it has to be in quotes. We can sell, make cell A2 equivalent to a number, let's say 55. Cells B1, which is first row, second column, is equivalent to cells A1, which is first row, first column, plus, yep. Because these are both strings, we can use the plus. But if one was a string and one was a value, you wouldn't be able to do that because of the mix of variables. You would have to use the and sign. We can do cells B2 is equivalent to cells A2, which is second row, first column, plus 2. And we can make a whole range, let's say A5 to B10, equivalent to 1. Now you'll see a bunch of changes on the left when I play this. You'll see cool, yep, and the different numbers that we've added. So along with this, we could change a font's size, we could change the inside of the cell to a different color, there will be <coughs> quite a multitude of things you could do with a cell, including whether it's hidden, a row is hidden, if a cell is indented, and the syntax looks somewhat like this. So we could change A1's font size, and because font size represents a number, we could use something like 14. We could change B1's font name to something like Times New Roman. And because Times New Roman is a string, we put it within quotations. We change cells A5 to bold. And because bold is either a yes or no, it would be a boolean, which is true or false. In this case, we want true. This is the same for italic. And this is also the same for other functions you can do, like hide, hiding rows, which is, or hiding columns, which would be columns, let's say, uh, 8 dot hidden is equivalent to true. We can also change the indent level, which is cells, let's say, 7, 1 dot indent level equals 4. And lastly, we can change the inside of a cell, the color specifically. So we can do cells a8 dot interior, because we're changing the inside, and the color index specifically. And then we can use a number 4 just for different colors. If you're looking for a set of colors, you can go on Google and just look up what color corresponds to which number. If I play this, we'll see on the left that there will be a lot of changes. Specifically, you'll see that there will be a hidden column here, exactly how we typed. Now, on top of this, what we've currently done is no matter which sheet we're on, our macro will run. So if I go to sheet 2 and run this as well, it'll also pop up here, which means that it really doesn't correspond to a specific sheet. It'll always hit the active sheet or the sheet that's currently open. To interact with a given sheet, you actually have to label it specifically. And to do that, you would put sheets as syntax and then the sheet name. So in this case, we're going to interact with sheet 2. And we're going to put in, let's say, in cells D4, because nothing's there, we're going to make it equivalent to 15. So if I run this, we'll see that cells D4 is equal to 15. But if I go to sheet 1, and I run the same thing, nothing will happen. Everything beforehand will happen, because we haven't denoted a sheet. But the actual cells 4, 4 is equal to 15 will only impact 
sheet two. And this will be important when you go further on because some functions only work when you're on the active sheet, whereas others can manipulate as long as you denote the sheet first.